message, Kelly. Sorry, Mr. Call. Um, leave your name and number and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Thanks. Her message was an eerie voice from the grave. I would have done anything to keep her alive, keep her from leaving the house that night. And finding the young woman's mobile was key to solving her murder. Kelly's phone's out there. Who's got it? Tonight, the tragic tale of 26-year-old Kelly Hodge, a young woman who grew up without a mother. My sister, she was exquisitively sensitive, emotionally and very physically too and was brutally killed and dumped on the side of a road like garbage. The things that have happened, nobody deserves that. A sex crime that had countless suspects and many dead ends. So you go from the peaks to the troughs. With her killer free to strike again. It was pretty scary on the streets at that time. The detectives chased one phone call after another. It's our job to find the culprit and give the family answers. I was at the casino and I was there with this other guy and you, and we met Kelly. Police emergency. Uh, hi, yeah. Uh, I think I've found a body. Can you get the police here? I'm on Old Sydney Road. August 26, 2003, a motorist heading home made a grim discovery. He's come across what he thought was a package of some sort on the side of the road. He believes it to be a body. It's wrapped up in some type of material. And with that, he uh, rang the police. So you're saying it's a red blanket, is that right? Yeah, look... I haven't gone right up to it. But as I say, at first I thought it was a bundle of clothes, but I think I saw some hands, so I think there might be a body in it. The body was found in the rural town of Beveridge, 42 kilometres north of Melbourne. At this stage, we don't know what we've got. We haven't even seen the body because the body is wrapped up in a blanket and outside the blanket is rope that's keeping it all together. We've already spoken to the pathologist. We're not going to wait till the morning. We'll get the post-mortem done then and there because one of the major issues for a detective is, has a crime been committed? When the body was brought here, the body was weighed, weighed only 50 kilograms, and we noted, of course, that the body had been wrapped with rope. There were a large number of blunt force injuries to the head. In addition to injuries over the head like that, we found areas of bruising, grazes, tears, lacerations in the skin. They involved the face, the arms. Really, a large area of the body was injured. And the first thing we've got to do is try to work out who is this person. And what we did in this case was check the fingerprints to see if this person was in the police fingerprint system. And as uh, it turned out, she was known to the police. Kelly Elizabeth Hodge, 26 years of age, of a Coburg address. Police now had the horrible task of letting her sister Stacy know Kelly had been murdered. It was about five in the morning, and I hear this banging on the front door. And I thought it was one of my obnoxious friends from uni. <laughs> and I'm like, who is it? And they say, police. And then they say, it's about Kelly. And I said, she's dead, isn't she? And they said, yes. I said, I've a drug overdose. And they said, no. And um, she's been murdered. I couldn't believe it. I knew she was dead. I kind of could feel it before that, but um, I never thought she, she would have been murdered. Kelly Elizabeth Hodge was born in 1977, the only and adored sibling of older sister Stacy. My sister's the only person I know who could pick up a snail, pat it and say, aren't you beautiful? 
She loved animals and animals seemed to respond to her. She was a very delicate child, exquisitively sensitive and emotionally and very physically too. She had almost white hair with these big blue eyes and she just looked adorable. The two girls lost their mother when she died of pneumonia when they were only five and six years old. My mum was not in the best of health and um, she has passed away and my grandmother has organised for us to be placed in her care. The girls were well looked after. She indulged us shamelessly. And were given tips from a young age as to boyfriend material. If Michael Jackson came on TV, she'd say, this is the kind of man you girls should marry when you're older because he doesn't drink, he doesn't smoke, he can sing and he can dance. So <laughs> for her, that's, you know, so. Instead, Kelly fell hopelessly in love with a man who hooked her on drugs and then pimped her on the streets of St Kilda to feed his own habit. And that's where she went on the night of August 18th. It was the last time her grandmother had seen her and eight days before her body was found. My grandmother called me and said that Kelly was not home and had not been home and I thought immediately that was very out of character. And after about a day, I was so cross with Kelly, I start ringing Kelly. Hi, it's Kelly. Sorry I missed your call. Um, leave your name and number and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Thanks. I start leaving a series of really angry and I phone calls telling her that she needs to call home, that we're worried, that she's worrying our grandmother, that I won't forgive her. While Stacey wanted to call the police, her grandmother didn't. My grandmother was, no, 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 she'll be so angry if she's not really missing. And by that stage, I thought there has to be a problem. So I said, look, I'm going to go to St Kilda and look for her body because there's no way she wouldn't have come home a week. I went to bed and then that's when the police have come to my home to let me know that they found her. Over a week had passed since Kelly disappeared and her body being found, and the police were now under the pump. Experience has taught us about the magic 24-hour window. If you're going to solve it, um, that's the period you're going to solve it in. But we were eight days behind it. We'd already started behind the plane. Evidence gets destroyed, the weather might have a play in it, witnesses aren't recalling things as they would. When we make the media appeal, did someone see this person uh, eight days ago? Well, hard for people to reflect back as opposed to, did you see this person yesterday? So we were behind the eight ball. Thanks for coming, ladies and gentlemen. The lady uh, has been identified as uh, Kelly Elizabeth Hodge. So the purpose of today is to try and get as much information as we can in relation to her movements. She would have made her way to the area of Grey Street and Gurner Street, St Kilda. This was the patch where Kelly began selling sex for a living three years before. I used to do uh, street outreach on a Tuesday night and I always used to see Kelly standing there. She was sort of a bit of a lone figure, really. She was supporting pretty expensive habit and she'd do the work she needed to do and then return to Coburg, to her grandmother. I think that's where she retreated to and felt safe and, and clearly very loved. We want a picture of her working environment. Did anyone see her at the time? Did she see anything untoward? Has she been abducted by someone? Did she get in the car that she knew? These were all the questions we needed to get answers for. Where Kelly stood was pretty quiet. There's a bit of lighting there, and you've got the street corner on the other side. But if no one was working that other corner, Kelly would have been quite an isolated figure. So we start doing a door knock. Some of the reactions we got was, why are you worried about it? She was just a sex worker. And that was a, an unfortunate reaction to get from some people. 
I think they see girls who work on the street as very separate to the girl walking to the office block or, you know, to the shop, to work on the checkout, whatever. They're not. Some of the reactions was, I'm not surprised, or I knew her. She was living at uh, Grandmother's Place in Coburg North. It was very reassuring when we met Charlie Bazina. He reassured us that they would work around the clock to find who has done this, and that they would investigate it the way they would any other murderer. We don't care the status of a person. We've lost a life. It's our job to find the culprit and give the family answers. And that's what it's all about. The family need answers. Charlie, why was my granddaughter murdered? And we hopefully bring someone to justice and get them off the streets before they kill again. A feeling as a father, as an uncle, I'm appealing to everybody out there that have child children, if they know something, to please come forward because nobody deserves to go the, the things that have happened, nobody deserves that. When Kelly was found, her clothes, phone and treasured denim bag were nowhere to be found. And police hoped someone may have seen them since. The morning she was murdered, Kelly was carrying a blue denim bag. Actually, that bag had initially belonged to me and she was using it to write number plates down when she was doing these transactions. My uh, crocheted blanket that my mother had knitted with Kelly, she would keep it in the bag and use it as something to sit down on or keep warm with, and as a security blanket as well. Kelly also never went anywhere without her mobile. It was her work and lifeline. Hi, it's Kelly. Sorry, I missed your call. Um, leave your name and number and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Thanks. Knowing that uh, she had a phone, that was significant to us. We needed to track that phone down. Not having it physically is a problem for us, but we can go to what we call call challenge records. And we were able to track down a phone call about midnight. And as it turned out, it was uh, one of her regular clients. That client spent 45 minutes with Kelly and then left. He was certain a person of good repute, no issues with him, and we we're more than confident that he wasn't involved with Kelly's death. So police knew she was alive at 12.45 a.m., but after that, they were at a loss as to where she went, who killed her and dumped her body 40 kilometres away from where she had last been seen. If the people are watching this, or whoever done this, we have faith in the police and you'll be looking over your shoulder all the time and it won't be long before the police apprehend you. On the streets, Kelly's fellow sex workers were hoping that was true. It was pretty scary on the streets at that time and pretty distressing for the ladies. Some of them left that, you know, they just couldn't cope with it. Their fears were that if he wasn't caught, could they be next? But then a call from a psychologist gave the investigation the breakthrough it needed. I might have some information uh, that could help about this sex worker that was killed. He was quite hesitant to speak to us on the phone because I think he was grappling with the, the doctor-client privilege type of thing. He told us that he'd been treating a client and this male person made certain comments to him that the psychologist married up to the media reports of, of having found a sex worker murdered. I had a client uh, come in that he'd done a bad thing to a sex worker. I think he placed himself in a situation, could I be treating the killer of Kelly Hodge? It must have gone through his mind. Enough so for him to pick up that phone and, and call us. I hope it helps your investigation. And I think the conscience was, if I don't say anything, 
and this is the offender I'm treating, and this is the person that may kill again, can I live with myself? And I think he took the appropriate action, gave us a call, and gave us his person's particulars. This was a bit of a eureka moment for us as investigators. I think we might have our guy. Armed with a warrant, the detectives headed out to search the premises of the psychologist's client. The man in his 20s lived in a caravan at the back of his mother's house. Going into this caravan, you know, you, you're bewildered by what you see as an investigator. There was numerous cuttings out of pornographic material. There was handbags there. In one bag, there was an identification badge of a receptionist from a brothel. The adrenaline starts pumping up, and you're just saying, right, we really got our guy here, I think. Let's move on with it. And then we start the investigation going back to identifying this receptionist in a brothel. She'd been assaulted, and you start building up confidence. Are we on the right track? Do we have our man? But police also had another suspect under their magnifying glass the ex-boyfriend who had put Kelly on the streets. They asked me if I knew of anyone who may have a vendetta or a reason to harm Kelly, and I did nominate a couple of people. One was an ex-boyfriend who Kelly had testified against, and he was serving time for murder. The fact that she was implicit in giving evidence against him was something quite significant. So he becomes a particular suspect you might say to yourself, well, hang on a minute, well, how can he be a suspect if he's in custody, which he was? But that doesn't mean the fact that he could have got someone else to commit the murder going into this guy's caravan. You start talking to them. He readily makes admissions. His fantasy was to assault and rape a policewoman. Take of what you will, whether just an off-the-cuff comment, but you know this person's got a problem. So he is a firm suspect. But as the investigation progressed, we find out that he's got an alibi. That's a good alibi. He couldn't have been our guy. He fitted the profile beautifully. But at the end of the day, what you allege you've got to prove. So you go from the peaks to the troughs. And we discard that person from the investigation. But that doesn't put you off the scent. You keep going. You're driven even more. On the streets of Melbourne's red light district, sex workers were scared. Have they caught him yet? That was a daily thing the ladies would say. They were fearful because we had nothing to give them or tell them. So all we could really say to the ladies was, look, just proceed with caution. They needed to because when detectives looked at the calls in and out of the jail where Kelly's ex-boyfriend was imprisoned, there was nothing sinister to suggest he had put a hit on her. It was another dead end. But you don't let the frustrations take over your efforts. We know the killer's still out there and we keep moving on. The detective seemed to be getting a lot of leads quite early on. A lot of them unfortunately turned out to be red herrings but they were always very good about letting us know where they were at, even if there wasn't anything new. Just to reassure us that we're not forgotten and that they are still working very hard. It was now a month since Kelly had been murdered and longer since Stacy had last spoken directly with her sister. The last time I spoke to Kelly, we had a massive fight and I told her I hated her told her to go hang herself, called her a junkie. I shouldn't have done it and I was totally in the wrong. And I hope my sister knows how sorry I am and how sorry I've been every day since. Kelly's fellow sex workers were also hurting. It's important to grieve. A lot of the ladies, of course, were upset. I wanted to give them something of Kelly. And there were a lot of tears that night. We all walked up to the, the corner of Grey and Gurna, and we all had candles. And this was in the very spot that, that Kelly used to work. It was absolutely, the atmosphere was, was palpable. I can't think that one person there couldn't remember Kelly standing there and weren't visualising it. 
I would have done anything to keep her alive. I probably would have run her over and broken both her legs to keep her alive. Keep her from leaving the house that night. Then a new suspect. Kelly had sold her car to pay for her drug debts to 34-year-old Justin DeGrucci, whose name rang alarm bells. This particular fellow was a suspect in the assault of another sex worker. But unfortunately, the rape squad didn't have a statement from the victim. They were very scared, and so the squad were hampered in relation to taking the matter any further. The kidnap and assault happened two months before Kelly's murder. The chatter around the streets was very much getting louder and louder about this individual. And I think the girls were starting to really think that the person that had committed this really serious assault could potentially be the one that murdered Kelly. We then executed a search warrant and we found clothing, shoes, and a handbag similar to Kelly's. Let me see, he's got some significant rings on his fingers. And we reflect back to the post-mortem. When we examined the body, there was clearly evidence of a very large number of injuries to the head. And some of these injuries had some rather unusual appearances. So there were literally areas of the skin that had been punched out almost as if they had been cut out by a sharp object. The peculiarity, which is not usually seen in weapons that we would commonly come across in our practice. We picture those injuries and we've got them in our head of what they look like. We then look at these rings that this guy's got on. And you know what, we come to a conclusion these rings could have caused a particular injury, the concave injuries in the face of Kelly Hodge. Again, our euphoria is growing. And as the search goes on, we find blood at his particular house. Then DeGrucci surprised the detectives and put up his hands for the assault on the sex worker two months prior to Kelly's murder. I'm not involved, I'm no murderer, I'm no killer. Charge me with this assault, but I'm not part of the murder. But the detectives weren't prepared to take his word for it. So while he was remanded in custody for the assault, they waited for results on the blood in his house to see if it was Kelly's. We weren't convinced. Let's see what the science tells us. Out of the blue, the detectives received one of the most important calls in the investigation from Kelly's phone company. Her missing phone had become active again. Major breakthrough for us. Kelly's phone has just been turned on. It's lit up. Kelly's phone's out there. Who's got it? Police traced the signal to a young man. We track this guy down and we speak to him. We go to his door. We're investigating the murder of a sex worker called Kelly Hodge. Do you know this person? No, I don't. Do you have a mobile phone? Yes, I do. He produces a phone. How long have you had this phone? Oh, I, I bought it off a guy. Who was this guy? A fellow called Jackamoff. So who's this Jackamoff fellow? Detectives tracked down Jackamoff's address and checked his police record. He's got no criminal history. We learn that he's a bricklayer. We know he lives in the West Matters address which is not far from where Kelly Hodge's body was found. It appears to be a legitimate person living in a normal suburban area. Another lead we've got to tidy up and account for this person, because he's a link. When police went to Novika Jakimov's house, there was no answer. So they left a calling card, and not long after, the 34-year-old called them. I think you're looking for me, because you've been to my house, I'm told. I was at the casino, and I was there with this other guy and you, and we met Kelly. So he basically gives us the story that the three of them go back to his home in West Meadows. They had consensual sex with Kelly. Kelly then left with this friend of his. And lo and behold, when they leave, he discovers that she's left her phone behind. And I sold it. I didn't need a phone. I don't know what happened to Kelly. Nothing to do with me. 
She left with this guy, mate. That's the guy you got to be talking to, not me. Detectives now had three suspects. Jackamoff, the man they'd just spoken to, the friend he claimed left his house with Kelly, and DeGrucci, the man with the rings, currently in custody for assault, who told detectives he didn't kill Kelly. This guy, with the rings and the clothing and the blood, ticked all the boxes. But when the results came back on the blood in DeGrucci's house, it wasn't what they expected. It's not Kelly Hodges' DNA. It is not Kelly Hodges' blood. Justin DeGrucci was ruled out of the murder of Kelly Hodge, but he was found guilty of the assault and kidnap of the sex worker and sentenced to nine and a half years imprisonment. The ladies uh, were very relieved when he was taken off the street. But at the end of the day, we'd still lost Kelly. Kelly had been murdered. The person that had committed this crime was still out there. The Victorian police had now been chasing the murderer of Kelly Hodge for two months. For Stacey and the family, it was tough. The wait for them to find the person responsible is excruciating. You think they're never going to find them. And in my more wacky moments, I became a little paranoid. And I would see someone out in the streets and think, maybe it was you. Detectives still had two strong leads, thanks to Kelly's reactivated phone. And they had now tracked down the man Jackamoff claimed had left his house with Kelly the night she was murdered. And on finding him, the reaction we get was overwhelming. Absolute crap. That didn't happen. I wasn't at the casino. I wasn't with a girl called Kelly Hodge. I wasn't with Jackamoff. So we need to go back to Jackamoff and say, Sonny, I don't think you were quite honest with us. Jackamoff was now their prime suspect. A search warrant was obtained on his rented house. But again, he wasn't home. So as they waited for the real estate agent to let them in, the detectives went door knocking and spoke with the next door neighbour. They said, we heard a distressed female screaming thumps going on like someone was being assaulted and they put it down to a domestic dispute that's why they didn't report it as such eventually went away and they thought nothing more of it the agent arrives lets us in house is vacant not a stick of furniture in there we start walking through the place and we start seeing repairs to the plaster wall particularly in the hallway about the size of a football, basically. Not painted, just repaired. Said, you know what? That may have been Kelly's head going through that wall. Examination of the head revealed that there was a fracture at the back of the skull. Now, that's something that can certainly occur where a person falls over and strikes their head. However, the multiplicity of the injuries across the body let us know that this is not an accidental injury pattern. This is an inflicted injury pattern. It's the sort of injury pattern that you see in an assault. And when the forensic team was brought in and they used their luminol, the empty house became a scene of horrors. We may not see blood, but this test reacts with blood or where blood has been. So in the darkness, our scientists go through, start spraying the luminol, particularly in the hallway. Why? Is that's where our damage was. And this luminol is iridescent, and it lit the whole hallway up, basically. We actually found a handprint on the wall and a footprint on the floor. Our adrenaline starts pumping. That might have been Kelly's handprint on that wall, her footprint on that floor but we needed confirmation through DNA. That was going to be the clincher. But in the meantime, we want to speak to Jackamoff. Where is Jackamoff? The detective called me and mentioned that they'd spoken to someone who admitted to having been with my sister the night before she died. 
And then when they've gone to re-interview him, he's gone. And I guess at that moment I knew, I suppose they knew too, they've got their guy. They've got the person responsible, but he's um done a runner. Jakimov had up and left, but while his house was empty, it was filled with vital evidence. Things started to fit. The crime scene started to fit based on what we found at the autopsy, based on what we found now at the Jakimov house. What we needed to doubly confirm for us is Kelly's blood or DNA in Jakimov's house. But in the meantime, we want to know where this Jakimov is. I wondered how they would find him, but the detectives almost immediately put an item in Crime Stoppers in their Herald Sun. So we go to the media. It's prompted someone in the community to call Crime Stoppers. I am just ringing up about that bloke you're looking for. Um, I've, I've seen him. He's using a different name. I saw him the other day. He's working in a pizza shop. And this call comes and identifies that a person fitting Jakimov's description is working in a pizza shop at Lawn. Lawn is a seaside town 142 kilometres southwest of Melbourne and a two hour drive from Jakimov's rented house of horrors in West Meadows. We notify the local police who go down there to assess, is this the right person? And once the police go into the pizza shop, they speak to this person whose description fits Jakimov. And it is Jakimov. He's working under a false name and living out of his motor car. So we instruct the local police to take them into custody and they bring him up to Melbourne with his motor car. And we start the interview with him. And he maintains the same in relation to what he told us earlier. I was at the casino with Kelly Hodge, with this male, and he maintains that throughout. The Victorian detectives were convinced Jakimov was lying, but could not yet charge him. They needed that crucial bit of evidence, and they found it in his car. As part and parcel of investigating him, we then go through his ute. We find paperwork in his car, and there's paperwork there that he's applying for, looks like a false passport. Maybe an indication of flight, indication of guilt. Can we also find some paperwork of a storage unit in Ballarat? At the same time that he would have left the West Meadows address. At the same time of Kelly's murder. Interestingly, Ballarat was in a completely different direction from Lawn and the rented house in West Meadows. So it looked as though Jakimov was purposely scattering evidence. So we go up to Ballarat, we open up a storage unit, we find furniture there. In doing our search, we can visually see blood on the sofa. Is this Kelly's blood? Whilst we don't have the DNA bank, is that enough for us to charge him? We are acting upon reasonable grounds. It is now arrest power. We've got the scene, we've got the neighbours, we've got the luminol check. It's a judgment call. And we make that call and we charge him with the murder. We were confident enough to know we had the right man. Confident enough to go to Kelly's grandmother, to go to her sister. <laughs> and give the good news. He promised us that they would work really hard. He promised us that they would find a person and he kept every promise he made to us that day. And we've said it, but I'd like to say it again. Thank you to the, to the detectives. And I happened to be at the local pub and I shouted jugs of beer for everyone. <laughs> but the joy was short lived. He pleaded not guilty and was going to fight it. And he can maintain whatever story he likes. He maintains that story throughout, right up to his trial. 
and the DNA comes back from the house. The DNA is Kelly's, irrefutable. And then blood comes back from the couch that was in the storage unit, that was linked back to the ticket, that was in Jekamov's car, in his name. That blood comes back as Kelly's. Job done. It looked like a straightforward case. While Jakimov claimed he was completely innocent of the murder, the evidence stacked up against him. We do not want to give the jury any room to move and prove it beyond reasonable doubt. If we do anything less, the jury can come back with either hung jury or an acquittal. And that was what Jakimov's defence team were hoping for. And surprisingly enough, at the trial, he went into the witness box opened himself up to cross-examination, and then he claimed self-defence. He was a very burly bricklayer. My sister weighed 50 kilos, ringing wet. It just didn't hold water. Here we have a bricklayer, upper strength, arms, wrist, hands, some 78 kilos, and you compare that with probably a less than 50 kilo female. But by giving his version of events, it answered one of the questions posed by the police and pathologist. Whilst we never found any weapons in the house, we learned about an umbrella being used by Jakimov. Jakimov claimed he used the umbrella to protect himself and struck her with it when Kelly attacked him over wanting drugs. The unusual punched out lesions on the skin of the head had a peculiarity, as if a small, tiny cake cutter had literally punched out a piece of skin. So when we later found out that it was a broken umbrella that caused these injuries, we were able to go back and look at them in the context of what sort of damage the body is caused by a broken metal object with that sort of circular irregular edge. The jury listened to Jakimov's version of events and came back with their decision. The jury didn't believe it, convicted and sentenced. Jakimov was found guilty of Kelly's murder and sentenced to a maximum of 19 years. He is eligible for parole next year. I don't think the sentence was anywhere near sufficient. As far as I'm concerned, that man should never, ever see daylight again. At the time, I viewed the sentence through the eyes of a law student, as well as the sister of someone who's been murdered. As a law student, I saw that it was a very good outcome. It was a reasonably lengthy sentence for what he has done. However, as the sister of someone who was hurt like that, it's not enough. Jackie Roth killed Kelly, and he didn't just kill her in her last moments. He set out to degrade her. To discard someone, a human life, on the side of the road is incomprehensible to me. After she's died, you know, I mean, because they're on the side of the road like she's garbage. And maybe she was garbage to him, but she wasn't garbage to us. My sister, you know, like everyone, just wanted to matter. In our worst nightmares, we never imagine our loved ones being murdered. We imagine perhaps they get sick or something happens and there's an accident, but you never imagine that your loved one's last moments I like that. I've struggled to articulate this. I think when I die, I want to be surrounded by kind faces. When my sister died, the only face she saw was the face of her murderer. How alone she must have felt, how angry he must have looked. <laughs>